today this video looks a little different than what we might normally see featured on our channel but I felt like the gravity of this news is really worth commenting on and also appreciating and reflecting on as quickly as possible so the the atmosphere the environment the nature of, of the video is a little bit different but um, also, I, f I feel like um, emotionally, it's a little different for me than it is for a lot of other videos that we've done. So the news is, if you aren't aware from the titling of the video, uh, is that Full Tone is closing its doors and, and released this statement saying, it's with a heavy heart that I announced that Full Tone will be closing its doors in California after 30 years. The building which I own is up for sale Myself and my crew want to thank you for your support all these years and for putting up with my eccentricities as well. Do not feel sorry for me. I've made many mistakes and learned a lot in the past 30 years. The heavy heart is for my 10, 15, 20, and 26 year employees who are like family. I would have closed full tone years ago if it were not for them. I've done well financially thanks in part to you and to the many large years in the roaring 2000s and beyond plus real estate and some good investments. So it's time to enjoy the fruits of all that labor. I'm closing the Full Tone California shop because I will not start pumping my personal money into a business that no longer turns a profit. This four year climate makes 100% made in the USA impossible. Full Tone will remain a valid corporation. I'll continue to vigorously defend my $3 million worth of worldwide trademarks and patent. And we'll build a few pedals here and there as I'm vividly aware of what it takes to keep my brand from being stolen. My plans? My wife and I bought a well-known artist's 17-acre property and world-class recording studio outside of Nashville last year. And I'm going to go back to what I'm good at, playing guitar and recording my mediocre 70s rock. And I'll do the occasional outside project, particularly for unknown talent who could never otherwise afford to record through tape machines in great digital, let alone have 99 finely tuned vintage guitars, 65 vintage amps, and a ton of the finest microphones at their disposal. He then finishes by saying it's time for the old guy to move out of the way and make room for the geniuses of the next more digital generation. Thank you again. Feel free to reach out. Michael Fuller, Full Tone. So what I take from this is a few things. One, that he was presumably going to close much earlier had it not been for his love and appreciation and the livelihood of his employees. But also that he feels like in order to make pedals in the way that he makes them, being fully made in the USA, uh, is no longer possible and that he would have to then draw from his own um, money in order to continue to turn a profit. And while I don't think for many companies that's that's true, and I'm I, I'm speaking for myself mostly in, in this scenario it, where you know I haven't made every single means and modes of production inside the United States, it's pretty much impossible for most companies to do that because most capacitors, most resistors are made overseas, most IC ships are made overseas. I'm not sure the degree to which he's saying that things are made in the USA, but I can speak from somebody who's been in this business for 10 years or a little over 10 years, that uh, there's some parts that were never available. You could buy them maybe from US distributors of those products, but the manufacturing of them was certainly always overseas, if not China, then Taiwan um, are two of the most typical places that you might find things like pots, ICs, again, things like that. Also, most circuit boards are made over there, even if the assembly is done here. Um, but in terms of his operation, I mean, Full Tone really for our boutique industry is just prolific in what he did. And just to give you a sense of how well his pedals sold, the OCD, for example, has sold over 250,000 units. And I know that that number is maybe a few years outdated, so it could even be closer to 300,000 or more at this point. To give you a sense in terms of context of what that might be for a boutique pedal company, which he still in many ways is, I would say that a good selling company, like a good selling pedal, like really good, might sell 10,000 in a year, maybe 10,000 in a year. But then that arc kind of dies down because right now, especially with the way that release schedules work and the number of products that come out in any given year, you might 
you know, you might have hundreds of releases that are in the same genre and category as your pedal. So often there's a really sharp rise and also a very sharp sunset of the the pedals that that might be released. And and I and I can say this that to to have continued quality products and continued sales of a product that is as old in terms of its release date as something like the OCD. I think it's something that every pedal manufacturer dreams of having. Uh, very few ever get to it. And and I think in particular now, it's even more difficult to maintain that trajectory where you can release a pedal and that it's viable for more than a decade. And in the case of the OCD, it's got to be closer to 20 years that it's been uh, a, still a very popular pedal and still sells well. So just that statistic on its own, if he had released no other pedal except for the OCD, I think that that's, that's a pretty remarkable feet. I think the other thing that's really remarkable about Full Tone in just kind of reflecting on the legacy of, of Mike Fuller is that he, the quality of his pedals relative to the price is really unmatched. When I look at something like an OCD or anything, a full drive, right? I'm looking on his website right now, a Full Tone OCD is $122.50. And it has a PCB, but still a lot of it is hand-wired. So the main PCB, if you're looking inside of it, I believe it maybe has some sort of standoff or something like that that it's attached to so that it secures somehow to the actual chassis. And then it has wires, uh, you know, kind of hand-wired off from the PCB to the jacks, to the foot switch, um, to the LEDs, to the pots. Um, and... It's, it's a pretty involved process. And as somebody that is designing pedals to be very manufacturing friendly, I can tell you right now that if I had specced that all of our pots, switches, and jacks needed to be hand-wired off from a PC board, it would dramatically increase my costs because the labor is the most expensive part in a lot of this in terms of any individual cost of a component. And the more hand wiring work that you do, the more hand work that's that's done on a pedal, just the more expensive it is. And he and I might disagree on this. Uh, the the value of doing that in terms of a reliability uh, standpoint, I think is is somewhat nullified. Uh, I think if you do the PC board layout right and you know you know what the factors are that you're considering in terms of the stress on the parts and things like that, you can certainly have great quality stuff that has PC board mounted jacks and you're not going to have one issue. There is more error uh, in, in hand wiring that can happen in cold solder joints, etc. that aren't present in a lot of the wave soldering applications. And we've done videos talking about the differences between PCB and hand wiring and kind of the the drawbacks of of each and the, and the and the you know the benefits of each, and I think in his case you know and this is just me um, just kind of guessing you know here I don't I don't have any evidence to prove this but I would say that the way that they developed their products initially were sort of based on this style and this look, and they wanted to maintain that throughout their line. And, uh, and kind of keep the, the level of, you know, assembly really consistent. And they wanted people to be able to look inside and really see that it's a work of art the way that it's all put together. And that's, it's really true that it is. The other thing I would say about their products is that they look exactly the same as the day that you bought them. And, and that's a testament to the quality of metal. And I can say that confidently because the same company that makes our pedal boards and has made our pedal enclosures is the same company that makes his, although they use a different paint shop than, uh, than I use. And just the, the quality of the finish, the quality of the metal, the consistency of the bends and the fit in it, they just look incredible. It's like leather on a Mercedes from the 80s or earlier. It's sort of like they're incredibly well made. They look great. The fit and finish is unparalleled. Uh, they just look like the day you bought them, even though they're 10 or 15 years old, because the quality in the painting, the quality in the metal is just so much higher than almost anybody else that's out there. Mechanically, they make some of the best pedals. Any treadle style pedal that's out there, like a wah, the full tone uh, Clyde wahs or the new Supa wah, um, those are 10x better built than any wah that's out there. Any of the standard rack and pinion stuff 
are absolute garbage compared to the quality of the full tone stuff. Just the welding, the whole way that the thing is assembled, it's not die cast or made out of pot metal or any of that stuff, it is so well built. I have a full tone wah that's 15 years old. It, the pot doesn't scratch. Everything about it mechanically is 100% in working order. I cannot say that about literally any other wah that I've ever owned, including a lot of vintage wahs that certainly the quality standard was better in the 60s than it is now for most wahs, but this is just a step above everything else. It's just absolutely incredible work. And his willingness to take deep dives on things like the tube tape echo or the solid state version of the tape echo like nobody is willing to do stuff like that it just takes so much time and so much investment and he was just uncompromising in wanting to get to the bottom of whatever something was sonically and recreate it to exacting degrees which most companies would try and i can even say this about myself like if i were going to make a tape echo i would still try to figure out ways that i could make it more affordable to reproduce and that's like not even a, a thought that i think mike fuller had i think he was just like how do we make it exactly the same and like he was okay with like breaking even on that product i've even read that he lost money on that product just because he wanted to have something that was an exact replica of a tape echo. And just that commitment to tone and to the sound of something is just, it's totally lost in most of our industry. And and, and it's pretty incredible. The other one that uh, he really went hard on was the, the Univibes. And especially some of those early Univibes, the gold ones, the big gold ones, those things sounded incredible. I've had several of them. I absolutely love them. But even the new ones sound really great. And, and again, with that, it was like the same sort of thing. He went down the rabbit hole, try to create as exact a product as possible using exactly the same stuff that was in an original Univibe. He owned several of the original versions and really just tried to go out and create an exact copy of exactly what the vintage unit represented and uncompromisingly creating something that was just, again, the gold standard. And, and the stuff that he makes now, even with the newer version of the Deja Vibe, for, the, for what it costs and the amount of custom stuff, I think he's doing all custom photo cells, LFOs, all that stuff is not, you know, you can't get them anywhere else. You can't go to a Mauser or some sort of parts store and, and buy what he's using. He's like making that specifically for the pedal. When you buy an octave, an octave fuzz from Full Tone, he's making the transformer in there. He's not just like going to somebody and, and buying it. He's, you know, making everything custom that isn't something that uh, that that's available or, or able to be replicated he will replicate it and have somebody make it for him another one that's that's in that same vein the the tri-stereo chorus that he made that that uh, 80s rack chorus one-to-one -one replication of a tri-stereo chorus uncompromisingly so like every part of it the all of the chips the all of the bucket brigade stuff it's all the same stuff that you would have found in the original one and he just uncompromisingly made a one-to-one -one replica like this is really really hard to do like even if it's something that has come out before like a tape echo or the tristereo chorus or a univibe to actually go and like do the research and source the parts and be able to do it over and over and over again he's not like a small volume shop i mean he's producing tens of thousands of every product that he makes in order to do that it just takes a tremendous amount of organization it takes a tremendous amount of research and it depends upon a lot of different vendors to deliver and to be able to organize all that in the volume that he's doing i think is just completely unprecedented i don't think anybody else is doing what he's doing or will be able to do what he's doing in the future should this really be true and that he's he's out of the business or is scaled back to the point where he's doing very small limited runs i don't see anybody who could fill this void based on the volume that he was doing i just don't see that it's possible another thing that i think is really noteworthy about full tone is the way that they positioned the idea of true bypass and i know that there's been some pendulum swings to true bypass and away from true bypass but i think the acknowledgement or or the creation of the name as a marketing term was probably one of the most brilliant strategies that's ever been 
in existence in our industry. And I think True Bypass, I still, as somebody who who started in the rig building uh, arena and then kind of moved into doing pedal manufacturing, True Bypass is actually very valuable. And in the context of a pedal board where you do have the proper buffering, it's true that you want as much True Bypass as possible. You don't want to have a bunch of different buffers on every single pedal in between the input and output because it erodes the quality of the high quality buffers that are presumably first as your input buffer and last as your output buffer. You really just want to have the pedals that are on be the only representative buffers as any pedal that's on is 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 acting as a buffer at that point. You don't want to add any more to what's there typically. And the main reason for that has to do with noise. You know, you have more gain stages when the buffers are activated. And you want to try to mitigate uh, the number of gain stages that are on at any time or unnecessary gain stages. And a lot of people need to remember that something like a boss pedal, for example, it's not just one buffer that's in a boss pedal. Typically, they have at least two. They have one on the input and one on the output. So you're adding two buffers basically for every one boss pedal you have at a minimum. Some of them have even more than that. And so for him to create this term to indicate that a circuit is completely bypassed, that the input is connected directly to the output when the pedal is off. This was, I think, a really important distinction to make between other pedals that had come out before that. And although I think certainly he wasn't the first person to wire a pedal in a true bypass fashion, there were other companies that did that before him. I think he was the first to recognize the sonic consequence and name it in a marketing atmosphere where the general public would have some sort of understanding that there is a consequence to using a bunch of boss pedals in series, which can have a degrading impact on the tone. And by moving to something that was true bypass, like the pedals that he was offering at the time, those will mitigate a lot of that. Now, I think that the that the consequence of that is then you had people using all true bypass rigs and not using any buffers at all. So I think maybe some nuances of the explanation of the benefits of true bypass were maybe a little bit uh, glossed over. But I think that the the understanding of that term is still like, that's on the Mount Rushmore of guitar pedal terms when it comes to speaking about specs on your your pedal, whether it's buffered bypass or true bypass, he was the one that really cemented that in our industry, I think, separately from anybody else. I know he's even kind of done a little bit of a 180 on that and and offers, I think, an enhanced bypass or something like that on some of his pedals where they can now have a a buffered output to them at least to help kind of drive in between uh, various pedals. But I still think just the contribution in that alone is just really something that was a brilliant marketing strategy, uh, intentional or unintentional, uh, I don't know, but however it came about, it was really, really a smart, smart move. And man, he just, just his catalog of stuff is just, is just incredible. The OCD, the full drive, and there's been several different versions of the full drive, the 69 fuzz, the 70 fuzz. We already talked about the OCD, the tape echo, the tube tape echo, the solid state version of the tape echo, that 80s rack chorus. There's just been so many incredible pedals. I'm just trying to like, I'm trying to just look here, like everything that he's ever done. The Robin Trower overdrive, Plim Soul. I mean, it's just like, endless stuff we talked about the 69 the 70 the soul bender i remember that one the octafuzz just all these were just kind of like classic the other one that i really love that i don't see on here i mean of course i love the deja vibe and they had a, a foot pedal version of the deja vibe the other one that was really cool that didn't really get continued was the coral flange which was kind of I kind of thought of it as more of like a, a his his response to a TC Electronic uh, stereo chorus uh, pitch modulator flanger. Absolutely amazing. Doyle Bramhall used to use that one. Also, Doyle Bramhall used to use the Deja Vibe. There's just so many things here that that he made that were just so iconic and, and really changed the face of the industry. And I'm really bummed to uh, to see full tone go i know that you know especially toward he was always a controversial figure i think to anybody that was in the industry that that knew who he was um and had any sort of relationship with him uh you know i didn't know him personally uh i've only had one one interaction with him when i was looking for a certain part and i had called a manufacturer that i didn't know was a contract manufacturer for a part in one of his pedals 
And I, when I called them and left a message to say that I was interested in getting some pricing on this particular part in certain quantities, uh, I got a response back from, from Mike where he just said, you know, you know, do your own homework, you know, like leave my, leave this manufacturer out of it. Like don't, don't contact them anymore. And I think that that was kind of, you know, maybe a, a snapshot of, of what, you know, maybe some of his personality quirks were how he went about dealing with, you know, conflict within uh, the pedal industry or people that he thought that might be trying to uh, encroach on a, on a territory of his. But I think, you know, obviously in the later years, in the last couple of years, he, he's had some, some uh, you know, kind of run-ins with social media and stuff like that. And, and I don't really know the particulars of it other than that some people were unwilling to use his stuff. And, and I don't really want to make this a commentary about the, the personality. I really want to make it a commentary about his contribution to the boutique pedal industry because anybody who's making pedals right now uh, who, or who has been in the last 30 years certainly owes Mike Fuller a debt of gratitude because he forwarded the business in a way that nobody else did and really created the boutique marketplace, I think, as much as anybody could. And certainly his longevity has proved that he really did have something of value. And although there was a lot of people maybe in that early boutique space, they're talking about you know prescription electronics or... Um, SIB pedals or a lot of these companies that were early on, even even uh, way huge was in kind of those early boutique waves. Uh, Full Tone certainly had the staying power and certainly continued to release hit after hit after hit and has had some really, really iconic pedals that are still used on pedal boards to this day. So I'm really bummed to see Full Tone go and I, I hope uh, whatever's next for, for Mike, you know, it's, it's uh, enjoying and gratifying and you know, hopefully uh, the younger guys that, uh, as he said, the uh, the geniuses of the next more digital generation. I don't. I definitely am not a genius, but uh, we'll, we'll. You know, certainly I'll do my best to uh, to make him proud and let the the legacy of uh, analog boutique pedals live on. And, I, and certainly there's some other really great young manufacturers out there that I, I think will will continue to to carry the torch forward. Uh, maybe we we all hope that we'll have the 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 same uh you know just staying power and longevity of full tone i think we all hope that we will but uh you know it's certainly a a a, a big a big feat and certainly something that is is going to be pretty daunting to to live up to so i wish you well mike uh and uh man it's it's just a i think it's a really big loss for our industry not to have him as again as as polarizing as he can be his his contribution uh, i don't think can be overlooked uh, in any way he's just such an iconic brand and uh, and product designer so really really bummed about this let me know what you think uh in the comments about all this um you know pedals that you think are iconic that full tone you know has done things that you think about you know maybe what's next like you know is this are we going to see full tone get bought out potentially that was one thing that i was thinking about i know that leading up to this uh i had known that uh, there was a few companies that were trying to position to buy full tone and i think it just didn't work out um you know for whatever reason and, and i don't know what the reasons are i would only be speculating um so i don't know if this is going to be a break that we're going to see that, that will then result in there being more uh companies that maybe come in and, and buy out full tone or if it'll become absorbed into you know a company like boutique amp distribution where they already manufacture a lot of companies like uh you know wampler and bogner and friedman and morgan and and a bunch of different companies under one roof maybe we'll see something like that i don't know or if mike fuller is just you know uncompromising <laughs> and it's just sort of like a, a dumble in that way or is just like oh i want to do it this way i want to do it my way and if i can't do it then you know the company will you know, only exist in this limited capacity. As he said that, you know, he still may, uh, his exact words were, he will continue to build a few pedals here and there as I'm vividly aware of what it takes to keep my brand from being stolen. So, so we may see a little bit of him, but certainly a, a more curtailed version. So anyway, just, I'm, I'm, I'm sad about this. I, I really love full tone stuff. I have a lot of it here myself. Um, you know, and one of the first boutique pedals I ever bought was a full tone, full drive two, the blue one. Uh, and I think it was the two, cause it didn't have the, it didn't have the toggle yet that it was had a push pull for 
one of the uh, other kind of like uh, variations. Um, but man, just such great pedals, so iconic. It's it's definitely a bummer, and yeah, yeah. I just wanted to comment on this. Yeah, I'm just it's definitely definitely a, a sad day for for the pedal industry to see him, you know, kind of moving out. So anyway, guys. Um, yeah, it's, you know, I I can't say that it's good to have to be able to speak on this, but it's it's definitely um, yeah, it's definitely it's definitely sad. It's definitely sad. I'll see you guys later. <laughs>